period of time called the Radical Reformation. It began only shortly after the normal Reformation began. It was, I think, 1517 that we marked the beginning officially of the, of the Reformation in Germany with Luther. And it was only a very few years after that that uh, the Radical Reformation began. And it was called the Radical Reformation, or at least it's called that now, in retrospect, because the participants in this movement believed that the Reformation had not really gone far enough in observing its own stated ideals. Luther believed, or said that he believed, in a principle called sola scriptura, which means the scripture alone, as the basis for Christian practice and belief. And yet Luther, coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, being a, an Augustinian monk until his conversion, and having many Catholic ideas, can be, I hope, forgiven for not seeing his way around all of them. Uh, he, it's, what's amazing is that he saw his way around as many as he did. And uh, he had some blind spots, at least so thought the Anabaptists, and so think I. Luther's counterpart in Switzerland was named Ulrich Zwingli. And uh, he and Luther almost joined ranks because uh, one was leading the Reformation in Wittenberg, Germany, and the other was in Zurich, in Switzerland. And uh, they were, of course, near each other. They spoke the same language. They're both German-speaking, uh, and their Reformations had many things in common. In fact, Luther and Zwingli got together on one occasion, uh, and Luther had drawn up 15 distinctives of his Reformation, and he hoped that Zwingli and he might be able to both sign to these and sort of merge the two movements. And they did agree on 14 out of the 15 points. And the point where they did not agree, Zwingli was actually much more radical than Luther. Luther was still quite Catholic in his view of the uh, Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, thinking that in the bread and in the wine there was actually the real presence of the, of the actual literal body and blood of Jesus. This only differed slightly from the Catholic view, which is the Catholic view is transubstantiation, where the, 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 the wafer and the wine actually become, they change substance into the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Luther couldn't quite, I feel, pull himself away from that superstition entirely, uh, and he taught what was called consubstantiation, not that the elements turn into the body and blood of Christ, but that the body of blood, the literal body and blood of Christ, are present with the elements when taken. And uh, Zwingli, on the other hand, believed that the, the bread and the wine were just a symbol, just a memorial, just something to remember Christ by. Most of us here probably would agree with Zwingli on that, and, and, uh, and we would say that Zwingli actually was able to divorce himself more thoroughly than Luther from some of the Catholic traditions under which both of them had been raised. However, Zwingli had a group of young men in Zurich, where he was preaching, in 1520, he gathered some young men around him and began teaching them Greek and Hebrew and uh, ostensibly to make them educated men, and they began to study the, the classics in Greek and Latin, and, and they learned Hebrew also. And, uh, of course, he, he had them study the New Testament in Greek, and most of these young men got saved. Among them were some of the men we're going to talk about today in this session. It was when Zwingli began to waffle on some of his convictions that some of these young men broke with him and became known as the founders of the Radical Reformation. Uh, the break came over the issue, actually, of the Eucharist, of all things, uh, the Mass, as the Catholics called it. Uh, Zurich had been largely reformed under Zwingli's direction, but there were still Catholic trappings, one of which was that the, the, the church in Zurich was still practicing the Mass in the superstitious Roman Catholic manner. And uh, Zwingli felt that that was not scriptural and that it should be ended. So did his students. In fact, so did the city rulers who were working together with Zwingli in, these, in instituting reforms. Zwingli, in a disputation that he had with a Catholic leader, uh, actually, in this is in... Uh, this was in 1523, Zwingli promised that he was going to uh, abolish the Mass in Zurich by Christmas of that year. Uh, I'm, sure that, I'm sorry, it was 25. It was, uh, it was, no, it was 
October, I believe, of 24, 1524, that's when it was. And so his, uh, his followers, his young men who studied under him, uh, uh, agreed that that was a good idea and they were glad to see the mass go. But after the disputation was over, Zwingli found out that the city rulers, uh, whose support he needed to carry on his reformation, didn't really want to see the mass go that quickly. They agreed that it was not a good thing to have it, but they felt like the populace would not follow with such a radical and quick and sudden change, and so they wanted to prolong the practice of the Mass somewhat longer and phase, phase it out more gradually. And Zwingli gave in to their suggestion and, and uh, reneged on his promise to end the Mass by Christmas. Well, some of his young students were very upset with him about that, and they became a little disillusioned with him. They felt like he was caving in on his convictions. And some of them began to meet separately from him, and among them was a Greek scholar. One of the young men that had studied under Zwingli was a, a very good Greek scholar named Conrad Grable. And one was a Hebrew scholar of uh, considerable uh, expertise. His name was Felix Mantz, or Mantz, as we would probably say, M-A-N-Z. And these were two of the young men who had studied under Zwingli, had actually been converted under Zwingli. And now they were disillusioned with him because of his compromise uh, and they felt they'd been betrayed by him because he was not being was not standing with his convictions as they thought he should so these young men got together with some others who wanted to meet with them and they began to study the scriptures and on different issues and one of the things they studied for about a year was the subject of baptism now at that time all Europeans baptized their babies because the Roman Catholic Church had done so for centuries over for over 1,200 years, uh, Europe had been Roman Catholic, and they baptized their babies. Uh, Luther and Zwingli, both, you know, who spearheaded rev uh, reformations in uh, Germany and S Switzerland, respectively, they also practiced infant baptism. But some of Zwingli's followers felt like the scripture didn't support infant baptism. Actually, Zwingli himself, at one point, began to uh, attack infant baptism, but when he found out that the city fathers... Uh, that didn't go over well with them. He backed off of it, and eventually he began to persecute those who attacked infant baptism. Well, among those that attacked it were his former students, uh, Grable and Mons and some others, uh, a man named George Blaurock, or so-called as a nickname. Um, we're going to talk about them tonight. But they broke from Zwingli entirely at that point, and they were meeting for Bible study in the home of Felix Mons, and they had a baptism in January of 1525 in the home of Felix Mons, and that was sort of a declaration of independence for the church in Zurich. It was the first time in over 1,200 years that a group of Christians met together and declared themselves free from the state church and that they were baptized after becoming believers, although they had been baptized as infants. They were therefore called Anabaptists, a word that means rebaptizers, though they didn't believe that they had been rebaptized because they felt like their infant baptism wasn't baptism at all. And they didn't recognize their first baptism, so they would never have said that they were rebaptizers, although the name stuck anyway, and, and uh, in history we call them that, and even the Anabaptists themselves call themselves that now. They're not ashamed of the title anymore. It's, uh, it's funny how many times a title that's given to a group, a label that's given to a group by their by people hostile to them, ends up being their official name, like the word Christian, for example, which apparently was uh, a term of, uh, of derision, of a pejorative given to the disciples in Antioch at one time, but now we call ourselves Christians. Anyway, the Anabaptists were the rebaptizers, and that was a pretty dangerous thing to do in the 1520s in Switzerland or anywhere in Europe. Eventually, it became illegal everywhere in Europe to baptize uh, a person after they'd already been baptized as an infant. It actually, there were laws passed by the emperor that required all infants to continue to be baptized and that forbade adults who had been baptized as infants from being baptized again. And Conrad Grable's child that was born, uh, I think in 1523, a couple of years before he was rebaptized, uh, he refused to baptize the child. But that was before there were any laws about it. They didn't need laws before then because everyone baptized their children. When it, it began to be a custom among the Anabaptists. They, they wouldn't baptize their babies. And they all, although having been baptized as babies themselves, they all got rebaptized. Eventually, there was a, a, this was made a capital offense throughout Europe. 
Now, you might think that's ridiculous. I mean, we have people today, we have Presbyterians and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Catholics and Methodists who baptize their babies, and we, you know, we don't, you know, we would never think of killing them, and they probably wouldn't think about killing us if, if we're not, if we don't baptize our babies. They wouldn't, I mean, it's just not that big an issue. And it might be shocking to us that the state church would find it so threatening that these people would rebaptize and wouldn't baptize their babies. But the reason for this is that the church and the state in every country in Europe were linked inseparably. And to be baptized into the church was part of being a citizen of the state. And if somebody didn't baptize their baby into the church, it's sort of like not getting a social security card or something today. You know, I mean, well, how are they going to be tied into the system? You know, how, how's, the, how's the state going to control these people? They're not officially members of society, you know. And uh, that was very controversial and, of course, became very illegal. And many people died, over four or 5,000 Anabaptists were actually uh, martyred by Protestants and by Catholics and by the state for their stand that they took. Now, the, I gave you that information last time, and we talked. We kind of had an overview of the movement. I want to talk about some specific men, some specific cases, and give more details about their stories tonight. Those men are going to be Conrad Grable, Felix Mantz, uh, George Blaurock, and Michael Sattler. These men were the pioneers in Switzerland and in Germany of the movement, and uh, were very, you know, all but one were martyred. And the one that wasn't martyred, the only reason he wasn't martyred is he died prematurely before they could catch him. And uh, they would have killed him if they'd caught him. So these were men who sealed their testimony with their blood. There, of course, were others before them during the Dark Ages. The Waldenses and some others you know, were willing to die for their faith. But the Anabaptists are much more in the mainstream of what we would consider to be evangelicalism today. A lot of times uh, the, the movements that the Catholic Church had persecuted as heretical actually were kind of heretical in some respects. But uh, the Anabaptists, they didn't really held any views that were heretical. Now, they might have held some views that you or I might not fully agree with, but that's not the same thing as heretical. They, they held to all the basic doctrines of Christianity. But I, I want to go over again what the distinctives of the movement are and were. I did this briefly at the end of our last class, but it wasn't even in the notes. Uh, it was sort of an afterthought to share it. Now I've got it. Before me, I want to share it again. Three things in particular characterized the Anabaptist movement. One was an emphasis on discipleship. And uh, disciple, actually, there were four things. Uh, one was discipleship, which means they believed in personal conversion followed by baptism. And they believed in following Jesus, meaning following what he taught. Now, you might say, what's so radical about that? I mean, of course. But believe it or not, throughout the Dark Ages, and these people just lived at the tail end of what we call the Dark Ages. And in fact, their period certainly overlapped the Dark Ages, as we will see from their stories. But during the Dark Ages, it was not assumed at all that to be a member of the church, one had to have any personal commitment to God or to Jesus. You were just born that way. You were just you were baptized at infancy. Everyone was a member of the church. Everyone who lived within Christendom, which was all of Christian Europe, they were members of the church. Even the clergy weren't converted. Even the popes often weren't converted. In fact, I'm not sure if any of the popes were converted. I think some of them probably were, but, but many of them clearly were not. They were adulterers. They were uh, usurers. They were thieves. They were uh, liars. They were warmongers. Uh, they were all kinds of things that Christians aren't. And it's an amazing thing. I mean, we, we have such a different view now that it's hard to realize that there was a time about 1,200 years, uh, more than half of the whole 2,000 years of Christian history, where almost everyone in the church was unconverted. And to find a converted person was the exception to the rule. Now, you might think that the church you go to, maybe the majority of people aren't really saved. I don't know what you think about the church you go to, whatever it is. But uh, I doubt if any of you go to a church where you doubt that anyone is saved. And yet it would have been very common to go to church in Europe, medieval Europe, and there wasn't a single person there who knew Jesus or, or knew he was supposed to know Jesus. It didn't occur to them that being a Christian had anything to do with being converted or following Jesus. It's just you're baptized in the church, you keep up the ritual, and you die, and the priest will say last rites over, and you hope to go to heaven instead of hell. But the Anabaptists introduced the idea, they weren't the first to do so, but they did so afresh in their own generation, that being a Christian requires discipleship. It means you have to have a personal conversion 
And you should be baptized after you're converted, not before. And once you've been converted and baptized, you need to follow Jesus. You need to walk with him and obey what he said. And especially there was emphasis laid on the Sermon on the Mount. One of the distinctives of the Anabaptists has always been that they refuse to take oaths. They won't even uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the tr- truth in a court of law. And this is because of their, their way they understand Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, in which says, don't swear at all. Uh, I mentioned, I think, last week that I, although I'm largely sympathetic to the, Bab- the Anabaptist distinctives, uh, that's one area where I, I feel like I see the Sermon on the Mount teaching a little differently than they do. But they were people of conviction, and they felt like, we're going to do what Jesus said, and if they, if they understood that they can't swear to anything, then they wouldn't. And some of them got killed because they wouldn't. The state saw that as seditious, that they wouldn't swear to tell the truth in court. Now, they did tell the truth, but they just wouldn't swear to because they thought that was forbidden by Jesus. That was part of discipleship. You'd follow Jesus, do what he said, at least what they perceived that he said, and do that even if your life <coughs> was on the line. A second distinctive of the Anabaptist movement was their emphasis on love. And, of course, that's part of being a disciple, too. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And their love was expressed toward one another in the sharing of goods. Now, in some Anabaptist communities, like the Hutterite communities, they actually had a a common purse, uh, a common ownership of all goods. Most Anabaptists did not have quite that extreme of of an organized common purse community, but they did emphasize the need uh, for those who had extra to share with those who had little. So there's kind of a, maybe not a common purse, but a common heart. The idea that if you have something and your brother has need, you better give it to him. That certainly is taught in the scripture. And that was their application of the command to love your neighbor as yourself uh, among the brethren. But even they knew that Jesus had said you have to love your enemies. And they could not reconcile love for your enemies with fighting or killing or resisting the evil man. You might recall in the Sermon on the Mount, it also says, Jesus said, I say to you, do not resist the evil man. But he that would strike you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. And they took that to mean that all resistance of evil is not to be practiced. Once again, I think that they had uh, a view of the Sermon on the Mount that's a little little different than I would understand some of the passages. But uh, one thing they had that many modern Christians don't have is the courage of their convictions because they would rather be killed than defend themselves, than resist someone who would kill them. And uh, so they, that was what discipleship and love meant to them. Uh, a third distinctive of the Anabaptist uh, movement was their idea of church government. They believed in a congregational form of church government, which is essentially democratic. Everyone in the church has a vote. Men and women uh, have votes, and, they, and all the major decisions of the church are made congregationally. This is a, a practice still found in many evangelical churches, but was never heard of before the Anabaptists introduced it. Whether this is the right or wrong method of church government, we will not examine right now. There are, there are, there, that can be disputed. But, but the point is, they were the first to do it, and many churches now do it. As a, uh, I mean, it's amazing to the degree to which we are pensioners on the innovations of the Anabaptist movement. Today, we just take them for granted in many cases. But these people died for introducing them. There was also the fourth distinctive was their concept of separation of church and state. Now, unfortunately, most of the people who scream about separation of church and state today are the non-Christians who are trying to keep Christianity out of the public sphere. Um, And they always scream, you know, separation of church and state. Well, of course, That is a matter of uh, for the courts to uh, interpret the Constitution and so forth and and the whole idea of separation of church and state in this country. But the fact that anyone can even speak of such a thing, uh, you know, and not sound like they're crazy, stems back from the time that the Anabaptists introduced the idea that there is no state church or should be no state church. In Europe, every state had a state church. They were the first to say, no, we're, the church is not a part of the state. The state is not part of the church. These are different spheres, and there are different duties. Felix, uh, Felix Mance actually said when he was on trial, quote, no Christian should be a magistrate, meaning a politician or a judge, nor could he use the sword to punish or kill anyone, for he has no scripture for such a thing, unquote. So they believed that the duties of the state were too much in conflict 
with the duties of the Christian and, and the demands of personal discipleship. That the, it is the duty of the state, according to Scripture, to punish criminals, even to use the sword. But they believe that was for someone else, not for them. That was not for Christians. That's for magistrates. And obviously, that presupposed a very uh, sharp dichotomy between involvement in the church, on the one hand, which all Christians were perceived to have their identity in the church, and involvement in, with the state, on the other. And they, uh, Anabaptists, have typically stayed uh, away from government involvement. Uh, I don't know whether modern Anabaptists usually vote or not. I've never asked them. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did not. And, they, and you would probably never find an Anabaptist running for political office uh, if he's consistent to the original goals. That was an important distinction of theirs. And, of course, before their time, no one ever dreamed of a separation of church and state. And everyone who was a state official was a member of the church. Most of them weren't converted, but they were still part, you know, members of the church, whatever, whatever the state church was. And, of course, one of the things that the separation of church and state had, its, uh, had as a result of it is their pacifism. Anabaptists have always been noted for their pacifistic stance that they don't believe in fighting in war. Again, this is because the war, any war, is fought between two states. And, and the issues of the war are, are political state issues. Uh, the support of a political nation in defense against another political nation. The Anabaptists believe that we are members of another kingdom. We're not really uh, to find our identity in the state or in, in a political system or in a geographical area. We're, we're members of a kingdom of which all Christians the world over are citizens. And as such... Uh, we, don't, we don't share the interests of the state in preserving a particular form of government or particular um, uh, national structure because the Christian church has flourished under all forms of government in all parts of the world and uh, the issues that the, the kings of this world are so concerned about, uh, the Anabaptists felt, the church doesn't have to be all that concerned about. They're not the same. Our issues are to see the world saved and turned to Christ and discipled not to see this or that political expression or this government sustained in an international conflict. So they were pacifists, and that, those are some of the, the major distinctives. Modern Anabaptists still share, uh, as far as I know, most of these distinctions, if not all. Now, I want to talk to you about some of the leaders in the mainstream groups. Last time we talked about some of the groups that were not mainstream. There were the Zwickau prophets, uh, who were kind of strange in their doctrines and Luther had to come out of hiding to, to, to stem their activity in Wittenberg. Um, there was the Munster event. Uh, uh, the Munster event was uh, a group of people who were nominally Anabaptist in that they didn't believe in infant baptism. But in other respects, they weren't Anabaptistic. But they gave Anabaptists a bad name because everyone called them Anabaptists because of their views about baptism. And there was uh, this, uh, uh, this movement, Jan Matthews, uh, collected all these Anabaptists in one city in Germany called Munster and staged a revolt and took over the city and, and tried to set up the kingdom of God there. And the Catholic and Lutheran authorities around them uh, attacked and killed them and tortured them and put down that rebellion. Uh, but that, that whole thing was an ugly mess and it gave Anabaptists a bad name, but they weren't really mainstream Anabaptists. Uh, there were other groups that shared Anabaptist views about baptism but didn't have much else in common with them. The group I want to talk about and, and largely refer to as the Anabaptists are what we'd have to say the mainstream Anabaptists. And even these were not one organized group. There were some there was there were groups of them in, in Switzerland, there were groups in Germany, there were groups in the Netherlands, there were groups in uh, Moravia, which I think uh, is essentially what we used to think of as Yugoslavia. And and these groups were not really interconnected by any organization. It's just that the way I, uh, the way I would view it, God raised it up. God raised up the movement. And while we might suggest, uh, maybe we wouldn't. I mean, some of you might not suggest this. But we could suggest, possibly, that on some issues they could have been more balanced, maybe. They could have understood some scriptures uh, perhaps more, more purely. Uh, I'm not saying that critical of them. I'm sure I could, too. But, I mean, even if it is so that they failed to recognize the nuances of certain passages and they just took it all in black and white, uh, they are to be commended 
for their faithfulness to their convictions, which is not the case with Zwingli, or, or for that matter, Luther in his later years, or ever for the Roman Catholics. I mean, for the most part, uh, the Anabaptists were the most consistent Christians of their day, con consistent to their convictions. Uh, I want to talk about the Swiss brethren, because that's where it began. And I've already mentioned the names of these men. I just want to give you sort of a portrait or a sketch of the lives of some of these men and how they met their ends. Conrad Grable is recognized by all as the leader of the first group of Anabaptists to meet. They, he's one of the ones who was a young man studying under Zwingli and was disenchanted by Zwingli's betrayal. Conrad Grable's life spanned from 1498 to 1526. If you do the math, you can see he died when he was 28 years old. That was true of most of these guys that we're talking about. They died in their 20s. And yet they were the fathers of this movement. Uh, to me, now when I was in my teens, I, I would have thought, well, yeah, okay, 20s, that's pretty old. And I was, I was sort of an Anabaptist type when I was in my teens. But now that I'm in my 40s, I think, man, these, these guys were just kids. But, but many of them were well-trained you know, scholars in Greek and Hebrew and so forth. I mean, they were young, but they were no um, slackers. They were, they were uh, definitely men. They were young men. But uh, Grable really didn't have a Christian background before he met Zwingli. He was the son of a city magistrate, um, and his father was actually kind of a crook. Um, using his position... As a ruler of the city, uh, Zwing, uh, Grable's father was able to get uh, like sort of like scholarships for his son from from various government agencies, and he kind of hung on to most money himself. He sent his son to, to university and to college, and he get these pensions for him. But the father would hold on to the, like two thirds of it for himself and just use it on his own things and. Uh, this father actually later was convicted uh, officially of this crime and was beheaded. But that's not really part of Conrad's story. Conrad Grable, as a young man, was sent off to study in uh, uh, various places, actually. He studied in three or four different colleges and universities. He was a humanist scholar. Initially, he, he uh, studied uh, uh, humanism and, uh, and was very attracted to a teacher of humanism who taught high moral values and so forth. But then he went to Vienna to study, and he had another teacher, and, and he, got, he became totally secularized. And he was not a Christian at this time. And he got involved in, in a lot of sin, as he later would tell. For one thing, he got involved in a lot of brawls. Apparently, one of the things that the college students did for fun on weekends was get into brawls, uh, uh, international brawls, where the students from one nation at the university were fighting the students from another nation, sort of like mini wars on the campus or something like that. And, and uh, on one occasion, a couple of Frenchmen got killed in one of these brawls, and, and Conrad Grable was actually implicated in it and, and uh, brought tremendous shame on his, his father, practically disowned him for this, and was kicked out of school and all. On, in one of the brawls he was involved in, he got a serious injury to his hand, which I think troubled him for the rest of his life. He had swelling in his hand forever afterwards. He also drank a lot. And he also um, was a womanizer. And later in life, he experienced tremendous health problems from which he eventually died. Uh, we, there's no specificity as to what are the particular problems he had, but he attributed it to his immoral life as a, as a youth in, in his college years. He said that he uh, rightfully deserved these uh, sicknesses and this weakness of his body. Uh, and he died at age 28. Most most scholars believe just from from the weaknesses the, the, and the illness that he uh, was it was chronic in his life after this period of his time, and he attributed it to his uh, sexual dalliances and so forth when he was a younger man. Anyway, um, in 1521, when he was 23 years old, he joined a group of students who were studying Greek classics under Zwingli in Zurich. And he became proficient in the New Testament Greek. He became a scholar in Greek, actually. Sometime the next uh, year, in 1522, he converted to Christianity through Zwingli's influence. We don't know the exact circumstances of his conversion. We know he was studying the New Testament in Greek. And uh, there just came a time uh, studying his letters, because a lot of his letters have survived, letters to his friends and family and so forth. 
And the letters that he wrote after a certain point in 1522 reflect total, you know, on, he was on fire for God and for Jesus. All his letters before that were totally secular, totally intellectual, uh, you know, just like a, you know, a scholar in the classics, you know, quoting things from the Greek gods and things like that. And then after a certain point, he was just talking about, you know, Jesus and, and the Bible and, and living for God and evangelism and things like that. So somewhere in there that year, he got converted. He, he received the gospel. Uh, we know that he broke with Zwingli because of differences initially over the Mass and its abolition or its non-abolition on Christmas of uh, 1524. And uh, he was also the first leader of the Anabaptists in that town when he broke fully from Zwingli. He was, uh, I, I mentioned last week, the, the first baptism, the first believer's baptism to occur in over 1,300 years occurred in January of uh, 1525 in the home of Felix Mance. Uh, there were several people there, seven or eight. This is the first Anabaptist congregation. And none of them had been baptized up to this point, but on a particular night in January, they had been given an ultimatum from Zwingli and from the town rulers that if the, anyone would be baptized as a believer, uh, they would be banished from Zurich. They'd have eight days to leave town. And... Uh, you know, when you own a home in town and stuff, and your family lives there, and all your friends and your jobs there, I mean, it's kind of, kind of an inconvenience to be banished from the town. But they, they met together as they were considering this and their options, and they decided to go ahead and baptize one another. But there was no one among them who had ever been baptized to do the other baptizing. So uh, George Blaurock was one of them, and he had been a priest. So Conrad Grable baptized Blaurock, and Blaurock then baptized Grable and the rest of them. And that was the first formation of the first Anabaptist meeting and, and Grable was from beginning to end the spark plug and the leader of that whole thing he was soon recognized as the leader of the Anabaptist movement in February the next month he and Felix Mance went door to door witnessing baptizing and administering the Lord's Supper to converts that they made they made a lot of converts very successful in evangelism um, he was a good Greek scholar, but he's also a good evangelist. Once he got baptized and got turned on to the faith, he, he just uh, he won a lot of converts. Uh, the height of his success was uh, his ministry in St. Gaul, where he baptized about 500 converts in April of 1525. Now, from the time that he was baptized himself in the house of Felix Mance till he died was only about one year and eight months. So he had a very short career as an Anabaptist preacher, but a, a very successful one, a very impressive one. A lot of people were converted and baptized under his preaching. And of that 20 months that he lived after his baptism, many of them were spent in prison. So when you figure the things he accomplished in that, that 20 months, and you realize that, you know, a, a good portion of those months, probably at least, a, at least a quarter of that time, if not more, he spent in prison. Uh, then you know that he really was busy when he was not in prison, got a lot done. During one imprisonment, which lasted five months, he wrote a treatise on baptism. And he actually hoped that he would get a chance to, dis to have a disputation with Swingley about baptism, because baptism... Zwingli had earlier criticized infant baptism, but when that was seen to be politically correct, he's pendulum swung and he, was pen he is now persecuting the Anabaptists. And Conrad Grable hoped that he might get a chance to publicly debate his old mentor, Zwingli, on this. And he actually said, he said, if, if Zwingli will debate me, if he can beat me in debate, I don't mind being burned at the stake. But if I beat him, I won't require him to be burned at the stake. And he's, you know, he said this and did this. He wrote this, this manuscript as a prisoner uh, because of his Anabaptist views. He writes this book on, it, on baptism. And he actually had the audacity to ask the authorities while he was in prison if he could have his book published. And uh, they didn't like that. They reacted very nastily to that. In fact, they, they gave him a life sentence in prison for that. Uh, he and actually at that particular time, Felix Mance and George Blarock were all in prison together and they were all given a life sentence. However, that life sentence didn't last very long because 14 days later they broke out and fled. They got out of the prison. Either it was, a small, it was either a weak prison in some way or uh, historians believe that they might have had some 
sympathizers in the system somewhere that helped them out. But, but uh, their, li- their life imprisonment lasted 14 days, and they escaped. And uh, he spent most of the rest of his life, short as it was after that, in hiding. Uh, he would write. He would uh, sometimes visit Anabaptist groups and preach there uh, secretly. Uh, he, he was banished from Zurich and from other places, so he was kind of on the run most of the remainder of his life. And eventually, the plague was you know, going through that part of Europe, uh, as it frequently did, and it caught up with him. And scholars aren't sure whether he died of the plague or whether he died of the uh, perpetual weakness and illness of his body that he, that he, he mentioned so frequently in his writings. Um, it was probably a little of both. He was probably greatly weakened by, by the, the sin of his early youth, and the plague may have uh, found him an easy victim. In any case, he's the only man we're talking about tonight who didn't end up a martyr. But that's, like I said, he didn't live long enough to be one. They were seeking him. Had they caught him, he would have been a martyr. But he died rather suddenly and very prematurely uh, in August of 1526. And the leadership of the movement of the Swiss Brethren, the Swiss Anabaptists, was taken over then by Felix Mantz, or Mantz more properly. Felix Mantz was uh, second to Grable in importance in the founding of the Anabaptist movement. But he actually surpassed him in eloquence and in popularity. He actually uh, was better known, uh, more influential eventually than Grable had been. He also was the first Anabaptist martyr to die at the hands of Protestants. In fact, he was the first martyr of any kind to die at the hands of Protestants. The Catholic Church had been martyring dissidents and heretics for centuries. So burning heretics at the stake and doing things like that was not all that unheard of. But up until the time that Felix Muntz was drowned, there had never been a martyr made by Protestants. There were more to come. But he was sort of the beginning of that trend. He was born, as was Erasmus and Henry Bollinger. Henry Bollinger is the man who replaced Zwingli as the leader of the reform in Switzerland after Zwingli died in battle. So, but Bollinger and Erasmus and Felix Mons had one thing in common. They were all illegitimate sons of Catholic priests. And they were all raised, apparently, with a good education. I guess having a Catholic priest as your father, legitimately or not, had its benefits, and they all got good university education and became scholars. Uh, Mons uh, studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and he became a, an expert in Hebrew. He was a Hebraist. So as Conrad Grable had been an expert in New Testament Greek, Felix Mons was an expert in the Old Testament Hebrew. So these guys, when they linked up together, were a pretty good scholarly team when it comes to the original languages. Uh, He joined the young men studying under Zwingli in 1522, and later, like Grable, he was converted to Christ through Zwingli's influence. He became disillusioned with Zwingli and his reform movement in 1523 and began holding meetings in his home, where he taught the scriptures from the Hebrew Bible. Later, in January 1525, the first believer's baptism occurred in his home, as we've mentioned earlier. Along with Grable and Blaurock, he was active in door-to-door evangelism in Zurich and in Zolkon, uh, in Switzerland, through which many converts were made. His labors expanded to surrounding regions. And these three men, Grable, Mance, and Blaurock, were frequently arrested together Uh, They were found together a lot, and they worked in separate fields, too, although Blaurock and uh, Mantz worked together more often than than either of them worked with uh, Grable. But uh, uh, these three men were arrested together in October 1525, though Mantz escaped. The other two were held in prison. Mantz somehow escaped when they were captured, but he was captured again three weeks later, and so he ended up in prison with them uh, in that year. He endured a number of brief imprisonments. Uh, it is said of him that hardly a prison in the vicinity of Mance's labors escaped being honored by his presence. He was arrested with George Blaurock in December of 1526 again in the Grinningen Forest. And at that time, Mance was sentenced to death uh, in January 5, 1527. The death sentence read, quote, Mance shall be delivered to the executioner who shall tie his hands 
put him into a boat, take him to the lower hut, there strip his bound hands down over his knees, and place a stick between his knees and arms, and thus push him into the water and let him perish in the water. This became the conventional way of martyring Anabaptists when it was done by Protestants. When, when this, the state was doing it, they burned Anabaptists. Anabaptists were burned at the stake by government officials. But when the Catholics, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. No, the, the state beheaded them. It was the Roman Catholics who burned them, and the Protestants drowned them. The Protestants thought that was real funny, real clever. You know, they, they called it the third baptism. They said, you know, the, the Anabaptists wanted to be baptized a second time, and uh, Ferdinand, uh, who was one of the guys, one of the kings who uh, insisted on, on drowning Anabaptists, he called that their third baptism, the sentence that they had. Well, so this gentleman, uh, this brother, Felix Mance, was uh, bound. His arms were put around his knees. A stick was put through there so he couldn't straighten out his legs. Uh, he was weighted with stones, and then he was pushed off into the water. And, of course, he drowned. One thing that's really uh, inspiring about his story is that as, as he was being carried bound to the uh, Limot River, which is where he was drowned, he was preaching and witnessing to all the bystanders. You know, there were people lining the streets to see him go off to his death, and he was witnessing to them about the, about the gospel. And he was praising God, as he put it, that though he was a sinner, he was, had the privilege of dying for the truth. And his mother followed along with him in the crowd, shouting out to him encouragement, telling him to remain faithful to Christ through this test uh, and don't deny the Lord. And, uh, and he didn't deny the Lord. He drowned and he became the first Anabaptist martyr. His last words before he was thrown in the water were, he said it in Latin, but even though his native language was German, he said, into thy hands, O Lord, I commit my spirit. And then he, then he was thrown overboard. Now, I've already mentioned Blaurock, who was a companion both of Grable and Muntz, and uh, his name was actually George of the House of Jacob. Blaurock wasn't really his name, though that's what he's always called. Blaurock means blue coat in German. And he got that name because at one of the dis- he was also one of the young men uh, with Zwingli in the early days, and at one of the disputations where Zwingli was uh, disputing with a, a Roman Catholic, um, Blaurock, I guess there was some kind of, uh, you know, conversation or, or some kind of interaction afterwards, and Blaurock made some kind of comment, and someone in the back of the room who couldn't see who spoke it said, who said that? And someone else said, the guy in the blue coat said that, because he was wearing a blue coat. And for some reason, he always was called blue coat after that. And, and so he's always called George Blaurock, which means blue coat. His, it, it was not, not really his name, but it, it became his name. He lived from 1491 to 1529. So he's a little older than both Conrad Grable and Felix Mance. Both of them were born in 1498, and uh, Grable and Mance, at the time of their baptism, were 27 years old, both of them. Blaurock was baptized the same night, but he was uh, seven years older than they were, so he was, he was in his 30s. But uh, he had been a priest, actually a monk, and after... Mons died, Blaurock actually exceeded both Conrad Grable and Felix Mons in uh, the extent and effectiveness of his preaching in the Anabaptist message. He was formerly a Catholic priest. Um, he joined the young men in Zurich. It, actually, when he came to Zurich, he was already a convert to Luther's views. Blaurock, as I said, was a Catholic priest, but he had read Luther before he came to Zurich and had been convinced of Lutheran views. So he was already reformed, uh, but still an ordained priest. But he had married, uh, and, and that was one of the things that Lutheran priests did when they, you know, the, the Catholic priesthood were not allowed to be married, but one thing, Lu- Luther was a monk, and, and when he got converted, eventually he married uh, a woman who had been a nun. And that became fairly common. Once these Catholic priests got saved, uh, they, they decided to get married sometimes, and they frequently married women who were nuns or had been nuns. Blaurock got married before he came to Zurich, which shows that he already had kind of split with the Catholic Church. But he attached himself to the study group Anders Wingli. And uh, as I said earlier, he was actually the first man to receive believers because Conrad Grable baptized him 
And then he, then Blaurock baptized the others because he had been a priest. Um, unlike both Grebel and Mance, Blaurock was not a scholar. Conrad Grebel and Felix Mance were both scholars, as I've mentioned. Blaurock wasn't a scholar, but he was a zealot. In fact, he had more zeal than common sense sometimes, or tact, we should say. He was a big man, very intimidating in stature, and uh, he would actually go into the churches, the Reformed churches uh, in Switzerland, and he would disturb the, the, the worship services. He'd wait till the preacher got up to preach, and he'd stand up in the back of the church. He'd say, excuse me, sir, what are you, going, what are you here to do? And the preacher said, I'm here to preach the word of God. Blaurock say, would say, God hasn't called you to preach this morning. He's called me to preach this morning. And he'd go up and he'd physically remove the priest and preach instead of him, throw him out of the church. And he got in trouble for doing that sometimes. But he was kind of Im- impulsive and kind of, he wasn't quite as non-resistant, I guess, as some of the Anabaptists. I-, I think he actually held to non-resistant views, but uh, he must have felt like at times there's, there's a place for muscle in the Christian life or something. Uh, I hope there's not need for too much or else I'm going to be deficient in the Christian life. But anyway, he had a lot of it, and he's sometimes called the Hercules of the Anabaptist movement. (laughs) Um, He ministered closely with Mance, as I mentioned earlier. They they worked together with Grable also, but there were times when Grable worked in one field and Mance and and Blaurock would work together in another. And they were all, you know, imprisoned together sometimes, as I've also mentioned. The day that Mance was drowned... uh, well, Mance had been arrested in Blaurock also. They were, they were held in prison together. And when Mance was drowned, Blaurock was not. Uh, but he was stripped to the waist and beaten severely uh, with rods. And he was banished from Zurich. And he left Zurich. He never came back there. Um, from there, he went to Bern. And he got kicked out of there. After facing Zwingli in a public debate, uh, Zwingli won, but he always won just because the people who were the judges of it were Zwingli in, in their theology. And he was banished from Bern, and he went to Beale. That's the only only city in Switzerland I've ever been to is Beale. I uh, can't tell you where it is because I went there by train after dark and didn't ever look at it on a map. I was I out there for a week. But Beale was a, a town that uh, Blaurock preached in for a while. Then he got kicked out of there too, so he left Switzerland altogether for good. He went down to been burned at the stake and so they were looking for a pastor there was a job opening for him and he took it and he got burned at the stake too um, he and one of the laymen in his church were arrested together uh, Hans Langeger was the layman who was arrested with him August of 1529 so he outlasted some of his compatriots by a couple of years but he was uh, also tortured and he and the layman who was with him were burned at the stake on September 6th, uh, 1529. But like Felix Mance, uh, he preached to the bystanders as he was led to the place of his execution. And that brings us tonight to the last person I intend to talk about this evening, and that's Michael Sattler. Michael Sattler lived from 1490, so he was even a little older than Blaurock, but he died sooner. He died in 1527. So he got to be 35, 37 years old before he died. Got to be an old man for an Anabaptist later. But he was born in Stauffen, Austria. And when he was a youth, he joined a Benedictine monastery in Freiburg, Germany. Eventually, because of his diligence in study and in piety, he rose in rank in the monastery to become the prior of the monastery. However, he began to uh, take in some lectures at the local university, and he learned Greek and Hebrew. Actually, he became proficient in both those languages while he was there. And he began to read the letters of Paul in Greek. I don't know why you'd have to read it in Greek. I I could have reached the same conclusions written in English. But uh, he, he read Paul's letters in Greek, and he also read the writings of Luther while he was there at the monastery. Because Luther was a controversial guy, you know, everyone was talking about him, and so he read him. Well, he became convinced of Lutheran ideas. He also became very disillusioned with the corruption of his fellow monks. And uh, so he left the monastery and he, he left Catholicism at the same time, having been convinced of Lutheran ideas, not yet an Anabaptist. 
He married a woman who had been a nun, as monks and priests often did when they left the Catholic Church. And in 1525, he was back in Austria, but Ferdinand, the king, uh, announced an intention to execute and exterminate all heretics. And since Anabaptists were considered heretics, Michael Sattler and his wife uh, left Austria and went to Switzerland. And they went to Zurich. And there they met the Anabaptists. Now, he had been converted to Lutheranism by reading Luther, but he had not yet considered Anabaptism. And, and he met the Anabaptists in Zurich. And, uh, and he became convinced that they were saying what the Scripture said. And so he converted to Anabaptism himself. He became a preacher, of course, uh, of the Anabaptist faith, holding secret meetings in various forests. They had to have very secret meetings because there was a death sentence on them if they were caught. He was caught in November 1525, uh, but instead of being killed, probably because he was not Swiss himself, he was expelled from Switzerland, and he returned to his hometown in Austria briefly. Then he settled in Germany. Now, in Germany, he, he found an audience that appreciated his preaching, enough so that he was invited to come and speak at a conference of Anabaptists. It was secret. It was a clandestine meeting, but it was a conference of Anabaptists in Schleitheim, Germany, in February 1527. Schleitheim uh, is a name that is now uh, known to Anabaptists uh, because of the Schleitheim Confession, which Michael Sattler actually wrote and he brought it to the Schleitheim Conference and presented it. And the Anabaptists from Switzerland and Germany who were there uh, agreed that this was a, a, would establish norms for, for the Anabaptist movement. There had never yet been any kind of organization of the Anabaptist movement. And what uh, Michael Sattler had written was sort of like a, a manual of church order and discipline. A lot like what the Didache was in the first or second century. There was, it was sort of a manual of how church procedures. One of the things that he, he wrote about was how to replace a pastor when your pastor is martyred. I, I wonder how many of the bylaws of modern churches in America have, uh, have a section on how to replace your pastor when he's martyred. Um, I doubt it, there are any in this country. But, uh, but the, you know, martyrdom became a hallmark of the Anabaptists. I mean, it's, it was just a given. You become an Anabaptist and you start, you know, counting the days. And you'll become a martyr. And thousands of them were killed. Well, he, was, he became one of them. At the Schleitheim Conference, the Catholic rulers of the area got, uh, became aware of it. It was a secret meeting, but they became aware of it. And they arrested Michael Sattler and his wife, and quite a few of the other Anabaptists and their wives. A lot of men and women were arrested and put in jail and uh, brought to trial. The, the Catholic officials who arrested them recognized immediately that Michael Sattler was like a leader among them because, first of all, he had the Schleitheim Confession that he'd written. And he also had some other documents that told about uh, various uh, groups, Anabaptist groups, in Germany and Switzerland about their activities and their number and so forth. So he, he'd been collecting information and, and uh, that was stuff that the enemies of Anabaptism wanted, that kind of information. So they seized it and they saw him as the guy who had the information, so he was the leader. And they decided to make an example out of him. He was certainly not the first Anabaptist to be martyred, but the Catholic officials and, the, for that matter, the Reformed officials were getting kind of tired of not being able to stamp out this movement. So they decided in the, they'd make an example of Michael Sattler that would terrify anybody else from ever considering becoming an Anabaptist. And uh, he had a trial, and uh, it was sort of, a, sort of a joke of a trial. I mean, uh, he was assigned a defense attorney who was actually against him, uh, one of the people who wanted to see him killed, uh, and then everyone else was against him too. But uh, he was accused of a number of things, mostly of sedition. That was sometimes what Anabaptists were accused of because they wouldn't fight in war and they wouldn't swear an oath of allegiance and they, those kind of things. So um, he was accused of sedition. There were nine articles of the accusations that came against him. Some of them were just uh, things that any Protestant might be accused of because this was in a Catholic region of Germany. Uh, he was accused of not, you know, uh, of preaching against prayer to Mary and the saints. Well, Luther would have been accused of that too or Zwingli. But um, some, like he, he didn't believe in the Eucharist and so, and so forth. So 
So some of the things he was accused of were simply Protestant things, but there were some Anabaptist distinctives that, that he was uh, in trouble for. One was he taught that it was wrong to, to uh, take an oath uh, in a court of law, and it was wrong to... Uh, uh, here's, here's another thing. Uh, not only was he a pacifist, but he specifically said it was wrong for Christians to fight the Turks. Now, this was at a time where uh, Christians were terrified of the Turks because the Turks were coming against that portion of Europe uh, in waves and, and just swallowing up territory like crazy. And, and Europeans all lived with the secret fear that the Turks might come and, and invade and take over Europe. And so there were crusades and there were um, all kinds of uh, you know people being encouraged to fight the Turks. Well, Michael Sattler was accused of saying that he would rather fight Christians than fight the Turks. And that definitely sounded like a very politically incorrect thing to say in those days. And on, when he was confronted with that at his trial, he explained, well, the reason I would rather fight a, a, a Christian than a Turk, he said, I wouldn't fight any. I wouldn't take the sword against any man. But he said, if I had to fight one or the other, I'd rather fight the Christians because they ought to know better than to take the sword. Whereas the Turks are pagans and they don't know any better. And furthermore, he said, the Christians, of course, if, if they die, they go to heaven. Where the Turks, if they die, they go to hell. So he said, I'd rather kill a Christian than a Turk. Well, that explanation didn't satisfy uh, his <laughs> inquisitors. And uh, so he was sentenced to die. Now, not only to die, but to die gruesomely. I hope you won't mind my telling you how he was treated. It's not very pleasant. I could imagine some audiences getting angry at me for describing it. It shows how wimpy we've become. He had to endure it. If we can't even keep the contents of our stomach hearing about it, uh, how much harder it would have been to live in those days where that's what they did to people. Uh, but in particular, in his case, the first thing that he was done with him is they tore his tongue out, part of his tongue, with red-hot pinchers. And then they dragged him through the streets behind a, an ox cart so that he was, you know, on the cobblestone, the rough streets, he was, you know, his skin was all torn up. And at five different places along the way to the place where he was going to be burned at the stake, they, they had fires with red-hot pinchers in them for people to grab and to pull chunks of his flesh out. On, actually, they did it before they began dragging him. Twice they pulled chunks of flesh off him with these red-hot pinchers. And then at five different places along the way, they, they had pinchers waiting for people to do the same. As he was dragged through the streets, of course, the, the people lining the streets were cursing him and jeering and... and uh, cheering that he was going to go to his death. And, of course, at the end of that parade, he got to be burned at a stake, but not in the normal way. People typically died too quickly burned at the stake because uh, usually when a person is burned at the stake, they're, they're not killed by the, the heat. They're killed by suffocation because the fire burns up all the oxygen. Usually, people, even people who die in a, in a house that's on fire, they usually die of asphyxiation before they their body gets any burns on it because the fire uses up all the oxygen and people just suffocate. So most of the martyrs who were burned at the stake would suffocate and die before they really had any flames on their bodies. So they wanted to make sure that didn't happen to Michael Sattler. They, uh, they fixed up sort of a, a ladder arrangement with something like a hinge on the ground and they tied him to the ladder and they had the flames and the coals over here on one side and they lowered the ladder with a rope down so they'd kind of bake him or, you know, over the over the coals, and when, it, when he would start to pass out, you know, he, his skin would be burning, but when he would start to pass out, they'd pull him up again so he could catch his breath and live a little longer, and they kept lowering him down and, you know, torturing him this way with flames, and, and uh, anyway, there's something very um, powerful about his death, is that when he was arrested, he knew that they would probably tear his tongue out because they had done that to some other Anabaptists. You remember Felix Mance and George Blaurock had preached to the crowds as they were taken to execution. They didn't want him doing that. And, they had, and with others, they had torn out their tongue before too, before they executed him to prevent them from doing that. And he told his friends, they will probably take my tongue out so I won't be able to preach, but I want to be able to communicate something to you. He says, I will give you a signal if God has given me the grace to make the torture and the martyrdom tolerable. And he said, I probably won't be able to speak, but I will put my two index fingers together 
as a signal to you if I'm if the grace of God is sufficient in that time. So after they tore out his tongue and pulled flesh out of his body with red hot pinchers, dragged him through the streets and were baking him over this fire. Finally, the fires burned the ropes that were binding his hands. And, he, and just before he died, his friends saw that he put his two fingers together and then he, then he died. And his um, testimony, of course, was that the grace of God is sufficient to endure anything that his followers want to, want, will endure for him. But the story of Michael Sattler became uh, widespread, known. Uh, one of the Anabaptist leaders who had ac- actually first converted him to the Anabaptist cause in Zurich was a witness of his death and uh, wrote the story up and circulated around Europe. And it became an outrage to... Ev- I mean, the Anabaptists were inspired by the story and many people were converted to Anabaptism from it. And, you know, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. But even many of the Catholics and, and Reformed persecutors of Anabaptists were greatly ashamed of, of how he had been treated and so forth. And even to this day, uh, there are Lutheran historians who, uh, who express their shame at the way that, they, that he was treated, even though he, he wasn't killed by Lutherans, he was killed by Catholics. But Michael Sattler became a famous martyr, although there were many, many others who suffered like things and never became quite so famous. His own wife, who was arrested when he was, they tried to get her to recant her Anabaptist views for, for eight days, and, and she wouldn't do it, so they drowned her uh, eight days after her husband was burned. So this is the stories of some of the very earliest founders of this movement. Today there are, of course, Anabaptists, there are Mennonites, there are Amish, there are Hutterites. Uh, a lot of these groups, especially the, I would say especially the, the Amish, no longer have the Anabaptist distinctives of being evangelistic and so forth. They, they've become more of a cultural movement than a, than a spiritual movement. But, but uh, when you see these people, realize you know, what they've come out of. And not only they, but we. Because if you belong to a church that doesn't baptize infants, if you belong to a church that isn't governed by the state and, and, you know, and it has its own independence from the state, then you are a pensioner on the benefits of the early Anabaptist martyrs and preachers because they are the ones who introduced these ideas and they died for them. Most of us not only don't die for them, but we think it was silly for people to have to die for such things. Maybe not the church-state issue, but certainly the matter of infant baptism just doesn't seem like that big a deal to us today. But it was not a small deal then. And uh, so this is, uh, this is some of the early history. I'm going to have to continue this next time because there are more of these men I want to talk about. I had intended to talk about them all tonight, but when I got to reading their biographies and I, and I studied them from several books and so forth, I realized that it's just I just didn't have time to, to work them all up for tonight, and, and it's taken this long to just tell these four. I have at least three more men I want to tell you about, then I want to talk about some other branches of the Radical Reformation. So that will be next time. After that, we'll move along and talk about further developments in the Reformation and, and the Counter-Reformation. So we've got a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to go, and I don't make any apologies for taking three weeks talking about the Anabaptists, uh, even though I took only one week on Luther and half half a session on Zwingli. Uh, I think uh, I'd rather give honor to whom honor is due, and I think the Anabaptists were the move of God, to tell you the truth. And uh, we are we can thank God for for their willingness to be tortured and burned and drowned and so forth to bring the truth to Europe and eventually to America as well. Well, we're going to close with that. And... uh